waiting for almost a hundred to see more, uh, maybe a hundred people. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, I am Laurence, uh, the executive director of the French American Chamber of Commerce uh, of San Francisco, the FACCSF. Um, welcome to this fifth edition of France uh, versus Silicon Valley, what's next? Uh, today, uh, the topic is uh, reopening uh, businesses, challenge and opportunities. So I first want to, uh, to thank uh, Challenge, our partner, and Gilles Fontaine is here. Um, he's going to be the moderator to, today uh, for being our partner for this, uh, this live session edition. And we're going to continue. Uh, we, we still have a lot of topics to cover. Um, and I also, of course, uh, I'm honored uh, to introduce you to our guest uh, this morning. So we have uh, Anne Besançon, who is CEO CEO of Ericsson Imodo. Hello, Anne. Thank you very much for joining us this morning and for taking the time. Um, also, Alexandre Dayon, who is the chairman of Salesforce Advisory Board. Hi, uh, Alex, and also supporter of this live session and a great supporter of the FACCSF. Thank you, uh, Alex. And uh, Jean-Luc Deco, who is the president and co-CEO of uh, GC Deco North America. Um, hello, Jean-Luc. Uh, thank you very much also for, for being here this morning. So as you know, um, the, the topic is to have uh, the uh, parallel of the ecosystem between France and Silicon Valley. So for the French side, we have, uh, have Jean-Luc. Uh, and for the Silicon Valley and French side, also uh, Alexandre and Anne, of course, uh, they will all cover this topic. Um, I also want to thank very much our sponsors, uh, because without them, it won't be possible to do this. Uh, so I want to thank Bank of the West, uh, also Gemini, and of course Salesforce uh, with work.com. Um, Alex is going to talk a little bit about work.com uh, later, but uh, really thank you for your support. Um, as you know, as the Chamber of Commerce, we're a non-profit, non-governmental organization, so the support uh, of our sponsors and members is really important. Um, if you don't know us, we build bridges between France and California. Um, so we do it with uh, our events, uh, our uh, members, uh, and our corporate services. We foster and engage the French American business community and we help French companies to set up uh, their uh, activities here in the, in the US and in California. Uh, so why, I'm just gonna be really short, but why this partnership with, uh, with Challenge? So we had, uh, as you know, we do a lot of events where a lot of digital events uh, this year. Uh, we were supposed to do each year one of our signature events is the French American Business Awards. Uh, and we met last year with Gilles because the French American Business Awards is also for Challenge interesting because uh, Challenge is doing a lot of uh, articles on leaders in Silicon Valley. So, uh, so Challenge was interested in this event and we decided to do a partnership. Uh, so Challenge uh, was uh, uh, our partner for the French American Business Award. But since it's postponed to 2021, we hope, uh, hopefully we'll see, but uh, uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And maybe we'll talk about this today also, the, the reopening. Um, we decided since we couldn't do the French American Business to start this live session panel and the goal is really to have the French American Business Award alive during all uh, all the year uh, with um, with different sessions and different topics and we cover different categories so today is the reopening but we talked about also uh, the future of, uh, of food the future of wine um, well we, we talked about the investment trend uh, the next topic will be uh, I hope on clean tech mobility we will have many other topics to come so so uh, stay tuned for, for future edition. Um, but again, so we're really happy to, to cover this, uh, these uh, topics with, uh, with Challenge. Uh, and, and it's also for us a great opportunity to reach uh, an, audience, uh, an audience in France. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm, we're going to start. Just to, so to let you know, so everybody's on mute uh, this morning. You have a chat uh, where you can ask any question during the conversation. And Gilles will introduce the question also so during the discussion um, and uh, and that's uh, we're going to start i think we'll have a discussion with Gilles about 40 minutes and then open to q a so yeah let's go. thank you yeah thank you thank you very much Lawrence. uh it's my pleasure my honor uh we are a challenge we're very uh it's, it's a big pleasure and very uh, we're very happy to, um, to 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 have these uh discussion fifth edition of our uh, series today and uh, we'll focus on the as you said the challenges and opportunities 
the opening businesses after COVID-19. Um, well, of course, doubts and worries mount, uh, both in France and, uh, and the United States, and both countries are prepared to, uh, or are already uh, reopening their businesses and, and uh, exiting this, this lockdown, each in its own way, at its own pace. You can see this very uh, annoying decor behind me. Well, that's work, that's uh, Chalon's office. Uh, so yes, here in Paris, we're back at work, back, at, back uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in, in our offices. Uh, some things m m might be a quite exotic for, for people in the United States um, uh, today, but uh, of course, uh, we have a different way of, uh, of uh, approaching this, this, uh, this pandemic. And uh, uh, the questions are mounting. What are the plans for reopening at, uh, at a large scale? How do you bring back uh, people to, to work? Do you uh, need to bring employees to their offices at all? Because, you know, technology uh, allowed them today to work remotely very efficiently. Is it even a good option to keep people physically away from their company on the, on the long term? Uh, and how can technology help to keep people safe, prevent new pandemic, and of course, help uh, business transform themselves after this, uh, this uh, episode? Um, so to address uh, all these themes, we have three speakers today um, uh, with very good knowledge of what's happening both uh, in, in France and in the, in the US right now. Jean-Luc Decaux, President and CEO uh, uh, of uh, JC Decaux, it's a, a very well-known global leader in uh, outdoor advertising. Alexandre Daillon is, um, is uh, the chairman of Salesforce Advisory Board. And uh, we'll start with you, Anne, Anne Besançon, your CEO. Uh, um, at uh, Ericsson Emodo, the, uh, call it the monetization arm of Ericsson. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about Emodo, uh, what exactly you do there, and, and uh, yeah, the first question with you know, technology and the way to, to get out of this crisis. How can it help? So, um, first, thank you for those who are starting their day with us here in the the US and thank you for those of you who are finishing that day with us in Paris. Um, so Emoto is uh, the result of the acquisition of a company I created back in 2005 called Placecast and Ericsson acquired us in 2018 and we're focused on mobility data and uh, monetization of carrier data in advertising, digital advertising in particular. And so we have over the years developed uh, a number of solutions uh, around um, not only media and uh, targeting, but also insights. And the reason uh, this is very relevant with what's going on with COVID and recovery and reopening is that it turns out that mobility and proximity data analysis uh, is extremely useful to predict uh, first off, to monitor and to see how people are doing with regard to moving about or staying home, but also how it affects business. So visitation of retail places, commerce, transportation hubs, etc. And uh, since the inception of the pandemic, we have actually developed a new project that is specifically focused on using this data for uh, government and public health purposes. And we're today working with some governments in Europe and some US uh, states. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is one of the aspects where technology can help, uh, not at an individual level for contact tracing, or those are Alexa's, uh, Alex Dayon's um, purviews, but uh, it can help in uh, providing insights around how people are behaving in the physical world and uh, and how it can inform um, public decisions uh, around uh, reopening in particular. Uh, uh, Jean-Luc, um, uh, JC Deco is, is, uh, has a global presence uh, from, from China to the West Coast to, I guess, in um, uh, all the five continents. Um, you've seen this crisis uh, live from uh, the beginning of this year up, up to now. Um, I mean, you, you, you're specialized in outdoor advertising. How do you advertise outdoor when nobody's there? 
that's a quite a change in your in your business model, right? <laughs> Yeah, we need to. Uh, Jean Luc's mic. He's... Can we? All right, can sorry, we much better. Oh. Yeah, sorry, I had to do sign language for a minute because I put myself on mute and then the host is controlling the. Uh, get back. Yeah. Thank you, Laurence, for uh, bailing me out uh, <laughs> of uh, the unmute button. Uh, and thank you, Laurence, for the invite and thank you, Gilles, for the, uh, for the invite as well to, uh, to, to, to discuss this panel today. So, Obviously, as you as you pointed out, and as we've seen um, around the world, um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, the world was shut down, and uh, the major cities around the world, and, and in France, obviously, that makes our audience, and ultimately, as a media company, this is what we are selling: the audience of the streets, of the people commuting through the uh, uh, the railway system, the, the, the metro system, uh, the airports, and so forth. All that. Uh, audience disappeared uh, overnight. So, uh, so we lost uh, all this audience. So one of the things that we uh, uh, developed uh, in the middle of the crisis is, is very much in line with what Anne was describing, um, is effectively a, um, a mobility index. Um, as we reopened uh, step by step around the world, but in France as well, um, it was very important for us to understand how the audience was coming back to the streets. And obviously, as we engage with our advertisers, advertising agency partners, that was a key uh, point to, for them to really understand, you know, how many people are back on the street. So, so we, use, we developed this mobility, part, this mobility index sorry, with, with um, one of our partner, a company called AdSquare in the, uh, in the data world. Uh, this program was developed by our data corp team uh, out of Paris. Uh, but this solution is one that we've developed globally as well, because the question is the same in the U.S., in the same in France, and anywhere of the 85 countries where GC Local operates. The, um, uh, it's basically the, uh, the, the gathering of uh, uh, anonymous and obviously uh, uh, GDPR compliant uh, using mobile location signal activity uh, around um, our assets. So really understanding how many people are walking around the streets of Paris and, and more precisely around our uh, uh, advertising displays, whether being digital displays or uh, analog uh, displays. Um, so that's one of the things that, uh, that we did, a uh, very useful tool that we track on a, on a weekly basis uh, uh, around the world. Uh, we also use other uh, data points. Um, as you probably know, we also operate a lot of uh, self-service bike scheme program uh, around France. And if, for example, in the city of Lyon, uh, we have this uh, bike sharing program. And we were able also to track the, uh, the level of activity that we have on a daily basis, uh, weekly basis, and, and monthly basis. And uh, so um, in, the, uh, in the last week of June, we were able to uh, see with the data that we have access uh, that we had exactly the same amount of people that were renting bicycles that pre-COVID. So it's about 30,000 rental a day. So we were able to track this activity uh, on a daily basis. Um, and then when we look at mobility and, and how the cities and the citizens of those major cities are changing the way they commute uh, around the cities, in, in, in Belgium, for example, in Brussels, um, uh, in uh, the early part of June, we saw that the... Uh, the, the average weekly sales pre-COVID was at about 19,000 rentals uh, per week. And uh, in that first week of June, we were at 43,000. Uh, so a huge jump, which shows that the people's uh, habits are changing. Uh, and uh, as we see, obviously, uh, I live in New York, and I can see uh, today uh, uh, people using the subway, uh, those numbers have decreased by about uh, 85%. Uh, and more people today are using buses because they feel more comfortable uh, with, uh, with having, uh, being sitting on a bus and then getting in the, in the subway. So that's one thing of the business that, that we did. Um, on the less tech side of the business, but because our other clients besides the advertisers are the cities around the world, we have contract with uh, thousands of cities around the world and including France, obviously, which, we, which is um, uh, one of our biggest markets and where the company started. Uh, but we got a call from the city of Paris uh, in the middle of the crisis. And as we were preparing for the uh, reopening or, or the end of the stay at, of, the stay at home order, uh, they called us and said, look, you know, we need to develop um, 
uh, hand sanitizers uh, in uh, public transportation. We, op we obviously operate the, um, uh, all the bus shelter program in the city of Paris. And in a matter of five weeks, we had to uh, design, uh, manufacture, and implement a, um, a long-term long program uh, for hand sanitizing uh, uh, units inside the, uh, the 2,000 bus shelters that we operate mm. in Paris, and, and also as well on, on more than 400 of the automatic public toilets that we operate in Paris. So obviously, as you ask people to go back to their lives, using public transportation and all that, you also have to promote uh, a, a, a safe uh, as, as possible environment. Okay, Jean-Luc, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the, to the streets in, 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 a, in a short time. Uh, Alex, what went, uh, how, how did you transform? How did you see businesses transform themselves uh, during that time? Uh, uh, streets got empty, but I mean, offices were, were uh, empty as well, and, and it, it might last for, for, for quite a time, right? Yes, uh, so I, I think what's, uh, what's interesting is uh, with Anne and Jean-Luc, we see how the consumer world has been impacted. Uh, but as you know, Salesforce uh, is an enterprise software provider. We are the leader in CRM, so we really help companies to uh, build a, a single source of truth of their customers, whether they are B2B or B2C. And when the crisis uh, started back in March, uh, obviously the priority was to, uh, to manage a crisis for our customers uh, and obviously get their employees in a safe zone. But as the crisis evolved, uh, we started to talk about reopening. It's kind of a new world. That's the world of 2020, the reopening. I think we've been focused on reopening. And I was in Europe last week. Uh, oh, you were? Weeks in Europe. Oh, yeah. 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 How and, did you uh, uh, I have actually, I'm lucky to have dual citizenship, <laughs> okay. so. <laughs> so I did all my COVID tests and did my travel and quarantine, but it uh, was interesting to, uh, to see how different the European phase are actually between Europe and US. It's like two different worlds. But for Salesforce, really the, as a global business with 50,000 employees, we first ask ourselves, are we going to reopen ourselves? How can technology help us reopen and make sure we do it the right way with the safety of our employees in mind? And as we were stepping into that, um, uh, that, that brainstorming, all our customers were asking the same questions. How do I make sure I'm going to be compliant? Because this is a new normal. Businesses are accountable for their employee uh, well-being. And the reopening is actually a massive, massive business process for a lot of them. So yeah. that's, uh, that's how we decided back in March to launch a whole new product line, which actually became production in June. I think that's the magic of Silicon Valley, which is when there is a new uh, problem to solve, we solve it in a couple of months. And we launched a product called Work.com. That's the, the logo you, you saw on the invite. And Work.com is really a reopening app. That's also an app that didn't exist in 2019. Uh. There's a new category of app called reopening app. Actually, customers are calling you and saying, oh, what do you do for reopening apps? Oh, let me tell you what we do. And what is a reopening app? Well, it's really all the business process that help you manage all the different facets of reopening. The first one is obviously the common center, which is understand, are you ready for reopening? Which region should you reopen? Mm -hmm. And track your employee health. You need the database. You need the single source of truth. For your employee the same way you need a single source of truth for your customer the second part of a reopening app is a crisis management if an employee is diagnosed with covid what do you do have you tracked have you traced the other employees are you calling are you reaching are you tracking how the campaign is run well that's kind of the same as almost like a marketing campaign you need to know exactly where do you stand uh, in the reach out and the process of making sure all your employees and are safe and sound and the last part of this, uh, of this reopening uh, platform is for us, the contact tracing uh, and being able manually uh, to contact trace your employees who they are meeting, where they are in your offices and facilities. That applies obviously uh, to uh, office buildings like yours, Gilles, where you are in your office, knowing that you are in the same room and some colleagues. And if those colleagues are diagnosed, you need to be notified in a confidential way without naming, naming the colleague who, who, who's sick. But you need to know you've been in contact with someone who may have been uh, diagnosed with COVID. Uh, so the contact tracing is very important. It applies also to hospitality business, to manufacturing businesses. I mean, you, you, you name it. Every business has kind of a need for making sure they know who was with who and where in case there is a, there is, there is a problem. 
And uh, on that front, Salesforce provides the, the database for the contact tracing, basically like in a CRM system. Uh, it signals from your customers. Well, here it signals from your employees where we're, where we're there, uh, at what time, and with whom. What's interesting is we also build uh, in a couple of months uh, an ecosystem of partners. Uh, the one I would like to mention is uh, Siemens. Siemens mm -hmm. is obviously a, a well-known company and uh, very few people know that Siemens actually has uh, a complete set of IoT technology uh, for buildings, for machines, for buses, for transportation. The Salesforce Tower is fully equipped of Siemens. In fact, the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, this big iconic building, every single light... The biggest uh, west of Mississippi. Exactly, right? the business west of Mississippi. In fact, every single uh, light in the building is actually a sensor. And uh, you can activate the sensor to track uh, presence uh, in an anonymous way or uh, declared way uh, if your employees want to. So you can actually track what's happening and you can trigger a reopening behavior such as cleaning a, a, a room because too many people were in that room at that specific point of time trigger the flow management, which is sent to work.com uh, notification, which elevator can you take? Uh, because at, in the Salesforce Tower, when we reopen, uh, the rule will be only for people per elevator. So when you show up at the office, every single Salesforce employee will go to work.com and say, I'm coming at 9 a.m. at the office. You will be given a time slot to show up in the lobby and a boarding pass issued by work.com to tell you which elevator to board, like a plane. Uh, so yeah. we manage the flow uh, digitally through uh, fields optimization, basically flow optimization, which is one piece of CRM. So we build all those technologies that now we are deploying with thousands of customers. So I think it's very interesting that the world has shifted also to this new type of application called reopening because businesses, governments, are uh, now responsible for the well-being of their employees or citizens. And the last thing I would like to say about work.com is we have, uh, uh, it has been so successful that we've seen uh, local governments reopening on work.com. New York is probably the most iconic one with a track and trace. Uh, Jean-Luc lives in New York. There is a track and trace uh, organization and application that is actually running on this uh, work.com platform. And also uh, the state of Rhode Island, which is the most successful state in the US fighting COVID has built their complete contact tracing uh, on the Salesforce platform. So as you can see, the Silicon mm. Valley uh, has shifted in a couple of months to a brand new world, including um, supporting those reopening business process. Thank you, Alex. Uh, do not hesitate to ask your questions now. Uh, I'll, I'll be um, asking them along uh, during the discussion uh, in the chat. You, you, you may ask your question whenever you want. Um, and you told me when we were talking uh, sooner, uh, something like, do not ever trust your GPS because there's something always, always wrong, right? So when it comes to lo localizing people and, 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 and understanding what they do, where they're going, where they come from, et cetera. How do you find um, uh, the available, reliable data to, to track people uh, and, and stay, uh, uh, you know, we still respect their, their privacy and so on. Uh, can you explain that? The first thing is we don't track people. Mm -hmm. So that's a Salesforce job. That's bad. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's an important distinction. So to the GPS point, um, qualifying what, what you said, um, GPS is not made for indoors and it's not made for densely urban building populations, right? So the moment you get into cities, which is also where you have the highest density of human beings walking around with devices, the quality of the signal degrades significantly. And the, um, the, the solution that we found to this problem is to actually use telecom operator data as a verification tool. So we don't use telecom data directly in our applications, but we use it as a way to clean and filter out the bad GPS data so that we only use the good quality data. Because if you have bad data, garbage in, garbage out. So if you're making business decisions predicated on having uh, half of the data that you're looking at is actually inaccurate, that becomes a big problem when you have massive reopening decisions in particular or in the case of the work we do with our government partners around COVID, 
you would give them the wrong signals about where the next cluster is going to be because of movements of population from one particular area of the county to another, for example. So um, that, that's the comment around the, the quality of GPS data. The other reason why it's important to use uh, operator data is that the quantity of data available is much greater uh, simply because you have perpetual connection with the antennas, with the cell towers, with your device. So uh, in order to operate your phone and be reliable, the, the operator systems need to know at all times which power you are connected to. And uh, that gives us a, a much higher frequency of signal and therefore much higher accuracy whenever you do um, data analysis, which is all about statistical relevance and all about scale and all about accuracy, right? So that's how we differentiate our products in the, uh, the business that we're in, which is advertising and, and media, but it's particularly relevant now that we've decided to also help with our capabilities and our technology in the context of COVID and uh, public health management and lockdown and reopening decisions uh, that we are, we are helping in, in Europe, for example, we're helping the government with uh, defining specific hotspot areas, for example, around um, shopping malls or shopping streets. And, you know, it's not individual stores necessarily, but it's, it's an entire area that's defined by a polygon. And you know that there is uh, traffic from people when things are going to reopen and monitoring this and monitoring where there's risk of contamination and then where people go back home, for example, and how they might export, if you will, um, an infection there. Or the same with uh, industrial facilities, factories. We have the problem with meat factories in the US. There's now in LA a problem with uh, apparel, uh, clothing manufacturing. So um, that data becomes really, really important, one, to be accurate, but also to uh, provide sort of an orally warning that if you know that a lot of people have moved from this place where you know there was a problem to another place, you can warn the authorities there that something might develop in the next couple of weeks. And we have plenty of examples of events that occurred, and then two or three weeks later, you have a problem, like the, the rally that uh, Trump held in South Oklahoma, we now have a spike in cases two, three weeks later. Um, and in this particular case, it was notorious, but there, there's a lot of events where you can uh, actually determine that the, the gathering of a lot of people in a highly dense way uh, created uh, further risk down the, down the line. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to uh, answer John Pommier, no, the, the, this, this um, conference will not be uh, running the whole day. It's, uh, I guess, 9, 9 a.m. in San Francisco, 6 p.m. In, in Paris. Uh, but so you, 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 you'll be joining us just for, for another maybe 30 minutes, uh, Jean. Uh, yeah, um, governments, uh, corporations, uh, city councils, they all, you know, they're uh, worried, uh, they have concerns of how to bring back people. We saw that in, in, in some countries in Europe, uh, also in France, uh, sometimes you, 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 uh, uh, you go back, you try to, you want to go back to normal too quickly and then, you know, things start to go bad. Uh, what are the, the main concerns? Maybe Alex, you can answer that one and, and, and Jean-Luc, you might also want to comment on that, but what is, you know, Corporations or governments, when they come to you, they have, you know, the, all these concerns, all these questions. How do you address them? How and, and what are the solutions? I mean, uh, not only you know to, to keep people safe and even prevent the, the new a new pandemic, but um, uh, also you know help them you know manage things in a different way and 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 help them transform the, their business also in in a way with some in, in some uh, circumstances. So I can start with the answer. For sure, we, we, we have now a new way to work. There is no going back to uh, the old way to work, the commute, the office. Uh, I would give the answer first with our perspective as, uh, as the largest employer in the city of, private employer in the city of San Francisco and a 50,000 
a global employee many, company. How many people, Alex, how many people work in that tower? Uh, you asked me the question, actually, so, and I've, but thou, I mean, we're talking thousands, I think six or seven thousand. I mean, it's, it's really That's a huge, massive yeah. building. So it's a, it's a massive building. Um, and also uh, Salesforce, we have a, a hoteling approach, which is uh, you don't have a dedicated desk. You uh, book online your desk when you come to work. And it applies to pretty much every level of uh, management. It's a very open collaborative culture. But the tower has been closed since uh, March 6th. Uh, mm -hmm. There is not a single Salesforce employee that has been in that building since March 6th. If you think about it, it's a pretty wild reality uh, for such an iconic building. And we obviously spending a lot of cycles uh, sharing ideas with our customers about what is the future of the workplace, those, those buildings. Uh, and we, we think the, those buildings are going to have a very different purpose. The way we're going to meet, uh, because I think right now we're in a really difficult situation in the US where people don't physically meet, uh, for the points that Anne highlighted. We know uh, that if you put a lot of people in a confined space together, there is some bad news uh, 14 days later. So uh, we also know that open, um, open air uh, meetings are way safer as the virus doesn't travel very well outdoor. Um, so, for example, when I was in Europe, most of my meetings were actually outdoor with customers. We had a couple of meetings indoor with no air conditioning, but a lot of meetings that were happening outdoor. Uh, so I think we're going to see a very different way of uh, using the space, uh, both the, the office space, uh, the way the office space is going to work uh, in terms of air conditioning and uh, ventilation, uh, as well as uh, probably privilege a lot of outdoor. I mean, the, the good news of the tower is we have the Salesforce Park just at the foot of the tower. We have one of the largest uh, open air park uh, on top of the Salesforce uh, transit terminal, uh, as, as if you if you remember your visit to San Francisco. So I think well. it's going to come very, yeah, it's going to come very handy to have an office building with such uh, an open air uh, area in front of it. So we're thinking about all those the, consideration right now we have the same thing in new york where we're just in front of brian park so i think those parks are going to be reused by the business <laughs> around uh, around uh, but clearly we see a shift in terms of uh, managing the flow and the density within those office spaces and the way they're going to operate that's why you need obviously flow management you need a lot of different tools to uh, to make the best use of those office spaces and also uh, less uh, physical presence. Clearly, uh, you're going to see a, a, a more hybrid approach that we kind of started with uh, hoteling ourselves uh, as a company, but you're going to see a more hybrid approach where uh, you will use the office space just for meetings and collaborative meetings, but you'll spend more time at home. And that's where I think technology, uh, the technology is going to be a big part of orchestrating the use of those physical resource uh, and uh, the way you're going to meet and collaborate. So uh, clearly we, we're stepping into a, a new way to work uh, and I'm, I'm confident we'll find smart way to be more productive. Right now, I think we pivoted really far into the Zoom go-to-meeting Teams world. I think we're all dying to get back to more physical contact, but as things are going to stabilize, we're going to have a, an hybrid approach and clearly rethink uh, the closed office space versus open air office space as well as how the technology can optimize all those uh, resources and track and make them safe. Jean-Luc, you yeah. know, when Alex says, uh, you know, he has his meetings, his corporate meetings now in the park just, just across the street, that must ring a <laughs> huge opportunity for you in, in terms of, of business. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you like that, don't you? It's, uh, it's obviously interesting because um, as we look around the world, um, how we've all managed the situation and how the different countries are managing the reopening. Uh, obviously, you know, we can see the extreme of California to what's going on in France. I mean, in France today, we've reopened our offices um, and people have to um, be physically in the offices no more than 40% of their work week. Um, but I was talking to some, some of my colleagues from, uh, from the rest of Europe um, in Germany and in the UK, it's more like a third of the people that, that are on a voluntary basis are coming back to the office. Because it's interesting because we've gone from one extreme to the next. Um, and like many people, I can't take it anymore to, uh, to work from my house or, or sleep at the office. You know, I don't know what the difference is anymore. Um, and uh, in, if, you, if, if you take an extreme, you know, in Austria, 
uh, we, we back fully open with 100% of the people inside the offices. And, uh, and over there, if you uh, don't want to come back to the office, you have to bring a medical certificate. You know, so that, that's because obviously over there they have less cases oh, and okay. they, they say you have to come back to the office. We, we, we fully back in business. So not where we are uh, in the U.S. for sure. I mean, because uh, in New York, our offices are inside the Empire State Building. So, um, I mean, I go there maybe once every other week and there is nobody there. And uh, uh, it's interesting because our business uh, during the crisis never really shut down. Um, uh, we were deemed uh, essential workers uh, because, mm -hmm. for example, in New York City, we operate more than uh, 3,000 bus shelters. And during the crisis, it doesn't matter. You still have to go clean, maintain, repair, fix all those, uh, all those pieces of uh, street furniture. So, so our teams were physically on the street every day, you know, still working uh, full time. Uh, it was obviously a bit more difficult to manage uh, during that time because every time we had people that had symptoms. Uh, we had to make sure that we understood. Unfortunately, at the time, we didn't have the technology, but we did, we did the good old hard way, talking to people. And, and we've had a couple of cases where we had to send everybody back home, you know, because the, mm. the team, although they were not supposed to work together at the same time, you know, as soon as you had one case, obviously, the, uh, one of the primary uh, goal of the company is the safety of its employees. So as soon as we had one case or what may have been a case, we just sent everybody back home. So uh, the tracking and the technology is obviously very interesting, very important. Uh, but at the same time, there is a, a human factor that is hard to manage. You know, when people don't want to come back to the office, what do you do? You know, uh, we did a survey recently of our employees in New York City, and one third of the people said that they'd be willing to come back either one, two or three days a week maximum. So uh, we're going to have to walk step by step, obviously follow the guidelines from the CDC. Uh, but in major cities where you have to commute through public transportation, it could be a challenge. You know, in Europe, in Germany, my colleague said all the people, they drive to work. So obviously, if you provide a safe work environment, people feel safe. You know, I take my car, I get to work, you know, uh, social distancing and all that. I mean, that's fine. But when you're in New York, you know, everyone has to take public transportation it's going to be a little bit more challenging for us to bring everybody back to the office. So obviously we will have to adapt. Uh, we've adapted very well with this, the, the technology that we are using today and it's working well. Uh, but you know, uh, that has some limitation as well. So uh, it's going to be an interesting challenge and one that every week we have to readapt to uh, the reopening or the reclosing as we are seeing it in California. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 part of, this, of your job uh, is usually to help um, uh, businesses, uh, stores, to uh, understand better their customers, right? Uh, collecting data uh, with data help uh, provide a better service, uh, better relationship with the customer. Um, yeah. How do you see things changing for these businesses in the, in the coming months, in the coming years? Uh, changes for good or is, do you see a, some kind of a back to normal uh, at one point? No, I don't think there is a, a back to normal. I don't think that the normal of yesterday is going to be the normal of tomorrow. A um, couple of points. One is uh, this is going to take a while, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the fantasy that, you know, we're going to get a vaccine in, in a few months and we're going to be able to vaccinate everybody and everything is going to be fine in, you know, 2021, I think is a very dangerous um, fantasy. So that's the first point. And, and, and the reason is um, it, it's going to take a while to be able to figure it out and then to produce vaccine in quantities that are sufficient. So it's certainly going to happen. But I think from a business management standpoint, uh, we need to plan for a, a good uh, 12 to 18 months and by then, habits, new habits will have formed, right? And I think, you know, part of it is how consumer behavior is changing. And in, in that regard, we actually ran a survey very recently because we wanted to understand how people um, have changed their, their behavior, not just physically. And uh, two, two numbers are striking to me. Two-thirds of people say um, a retail store that doesn't... Uh, 
offer social distancing um, rules and hand sanitizer uh, is not a retail place I want to go and shop at. So for anybody who's listening, who is running any retail place, this is the basic stuff to do. Uh, the second piece, uh, very interestingly, is uh, more than 40% of people are ready to try new brands. So that's for the CPG mm. business. Mm. And uh, it's a combination of availability, but also proximity, right? We have seen looking at patterns of behavior for shopping that people actually don't venture as far away from their house to go and shop. And therefore, they are going to new stores that they didn't necessarily go to before, and they buy products that are available there that may be different brands. And then the third interesting piece also of, of change there is uh, when you ask people who is the, the chief shopper in the house, it used to be moms, and there is now a significant increase, like close to 30% increase in dads becoming the, the main shopper in the house. And mm -hmm. I think that also has an impact on uh, what they buy because men are a lot less brand conscious than women. Right? So, and I see Alex, you probably have other, other information to corroborate what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know if it's personal experience or what, but um, th these are important things for both re retailers that we work a lot with and CPG companies to know about because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one of our clients is one of the largest CPG brands in the world. This is going to affect behavior everywhere. So it's a it's a global shift in people's behavior, right? So there is the quantity of people going shopping. There is the type of of shopping that they do. All of this is going to have over time significant impact on. Uh, you know, the value change, the, the different suppliers, all of this is going to be affected. So there's this massive domino uh, effect that's happening, but it's happening slowly, right? So mm. it doesn't make the headlines, but it's actually going to affect um, a, a lot of uh, different industries. Alex, you, you might want to, to comment on that, but um, Nicola uh, has a, a follow up kind of follow up question on, on, on that we were talking about. About you know, how, um, the, he says, uh, does um, the panel think, the three of you think, that the remote hybrid new working was going to happen faster in California than in France or otherwise the US against Europe? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, I'll take the French flag for a minute. Um, okay. You know, it's difficult to, I mean, obviously, on the tech side, the way people work in California, and I go there, you know, uh, a lot, we have many clients, including Salesforce. Uh, so I go there a lot. And obviously, people have always worked the very, very different way when you work in the tech industry. You know, the uh, the work from home was was suddenly something that was, that, that has always been part of the DNA of the companies. But at the same time, you know, when you look at the way Google worked, I mean, they tried to keep you to the office as much as possible. You know, they bring yeah. you food, you know, they are doctors, you know, they take care of your laundry and all that. So it's interesting because it's a, it's a paradox of like, you can be very flexible, uh, but you have to, you know, we'll do everything we can to keep you at the, um, at the office as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's that, that, that balance, you know, uh, the, the, the work, work-life balance uh, but it's interesting because when you talk to the tech companies and I don't know if it's the same case in, in at Salesforce but when you start a job uh, and you ask how many weeks of holidays do you have they say oh we don't define that you choose mm. and so they put the onus on the on the employees so uh, you know in France obviously you know it's 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 very different I feel like maybe you know I don't want to be, make a general statement that maybe we're a bit more conservative. I mean, certainly the tech companies in France, I'm sure, have operated the same uh, DNAs uh, in, in their businesses. But for, so certainly for JC Deco, um, it used to be that uh, you were allowed to work maybe one day a week, you know, uh, away, from, uh, away from the office at home. And clearly with this crisis, I mean, we're going to be changing things. Uh, but, you know, I think we'll still be conservative in that sense and maybe just say 
two days a week you can work from mm-hmm. you know and that's about it obviously we'll have to see you know how the whole pandemic you know evolves and and we'll have to adapt but you know the, the world of tomorrow in a in a new world let's say in a, in a in a in a safe world i think that it will be a bit more flexibility on our side at least from jesse the co uh and uh then then but i i believe that there is more flexibility mm. um in the uh, in california but how, how do you manage to uh, keep your people motivated how do you manage remotely your teams that's the question i think it's like the question right? of of where people work and how the management style. And I think not to compare contrast France and the US because, you know, Ericsson is a global company that has more than 100,000 employees in 150 countries. And they decided that nobody was going back to their office Mm. until the end of December, right? So there are a lot of workers that, that are in the field, right, obviously, uh, equipment and cell towers and all of that. So Ericsson is a big manufacturer of, uh, of equipment and provides services for, for telecom companies. But I think that the biggest difference I see, you know, I've been in the Silicon Valley for 25 years, is the management style. I think that if, if you uh, work in a company where focus is on the, the output of your work, not how you work, and your management is understanding that what motivates you is um, solving problems with others on your team and mm-hmm. producing whatever it is that you need to produce, whether you, you are at home or not is less relevant, then can you still do your job or, or potentially do your job even better? One, because you're not commuting to work. So for, for some of our team, we have actually seen them work more and uh, we periodically do surveys to check mm-hmm. how, how they're doing. And they're actually feeling more productive because they're at home. So granted, depending on whether they have kids or not, mm-hmm. the age group, and the type of activity, and whether their home allows them to have a quiet space to work, you know, but we have outfitted everybody with what they needed in terms of computer screens and headsets and chairs, you know, so there's also... How, how you manage your team is as important as the local culture or the regulations, I think. And, and Alex, there's another dimension. Uh, you know, once I thought uh, Salesforce was a rock band because you're, you're producing all these, you were producing all these huge events. One of them is very famous, of course, in San Francisco, but you do quite a, a, a different scale, but you do quite the same here in Paris as well. That's over for, for, for quite a long time. How? What, what do you do to replace that? Yes, yeah, so uh, well, it's a great question indeed. Uh, sometimes we do feel Salesforce is a rock band on tour ourselves uh, <laughs> when we're inside the company. Uh, but jokes apart, uh, Salesforce uh, has built all its marketing around its customer community. And the best incarnation of the last past 20 years of that customer community was translated through those big events, including Dreamforce. Uh, for those of you on the call who, who lives in San Francisco, uh, you obviously have seen Dreamforce. You probably have been frustrated by the traffic jams and the chaos you bring to the city. Uh, but that is uh, the way the, the, the marketing works. It's a communal marketing. We put our prospects and customers together and magic happen. In fact, sometimes we joke, we could extract Salesforce from Dreamforce. It would go as hard. So when the, the crisis hit, uh, it was obviously uh, a big shift in our thinking because suddenly all the events, the hundreds of events we had planned for the year had to be shut down. And I want to come back to what Anne is saying about the Silicon Valley, which is really defined by the beginner's mind. The past is the past. You can't change it. The only thing you can change is the future. And when this crisis hit, interestingly enough, we say, okay, well, uh, we can't do those events anymore. So <laughs> what do we do? Uh, what can we learn? Uh, what can we try? What, can, what are the new ideas? And actually, you have in Silicon Valley, uh, this, I think this beginner's mind really defined the difference for me between uh, France uh, and Silicon Valley, which is it's really about every crisis is an opportunity. Like we created work.com. I mean, it was not in our budget at the beginning of the year, let's be clear and we ship the product in June. It's the same concept, which is we all sat down, uh, both with excitement and frustration, because it was obviously a lot of work. We had to 
throw through, through the window and say, what can we try? We're going to learn from what are the new concepts? So obviously Dreamforce is going to happen. It's going to be digital. It's going to be completely reinvented. And I can tell you, and you probably saw some companies doing similar digital events. Uh, there is a lot of cool stuff you can do. Uh, so we're going to use this extreme concept of 100% digital and create something magical. Uh, I'm working with customers. In France, uh, I, I would uh, balance also my statement about France because I'm working with some customers uh, like uh, the fashion brands, for example, uh, LVMH is a big customer of Salesforce and Louis Vuitton is also a rock band mm. on, <laughs> on tour with their uh, shows all around the world and they're rethinking the shows. They're going to be digital and they're going to engage their customers and the audience in different ways. So we're obviously collaborating, innovating all together in that new world. I don't think it's going to be a 100% pivot. I think this year is going to create new things and, and the future is going to be a blend of what we're creating. I think there is a strong, strong pivot. What, what is exciting in the Silicon Valley is this capacity to shift super fast because companies are not super hierarchical. Sometimes uh, for French people, it's hard to understand the titles of companies like Salesforce because in fact, there is no real hierarchy. Uh, there is a very fast moving organization around outcomes and people reorganize themselves all the time. It's true for the, the physical usage of our offices. It's true for our marketing events. I think that really defines the, the, the culture. And of course we can do that because it's not about manufacturing. It's not about store presence. Our employees are indeed given unlimited vacation time. Uh, unlimited, obviously you have to deliver on your work so you, you can't mm -hmm. spend the year at the beach. But you have a lot of freedom when you work in a tech company in terms of how you use your time, your location, the tools you use to deliver uh, the outcome. And, uh, and I would just want to finish on the fact that it is all possible because of the culture and the simplicity of the business planning. I think the secret source of tech companies are their management tools. The fact, for example, at Salesforce, the business plan for the year fits on one page. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark, as a, as a methodology, it's internally called the V2MOM, uh, Vision, Value, Method, Obstacle, Metrics. But it's basically a, a process to make sure that the 50,000 employees are aligned around one business plan that is one page. And if we need to shift it, it's very easy to shift because it's one page. Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. companies tend to create those 50-page documents where they want to do it all for the year. And, and it's hard to maneuver when you have that complexity. So I think the, the tech companies have... Uh, have culture, cultural tools they build over the past years to be so fast, so quick, seizing opportunities and shifting that I think makes them uh, 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 pretty efficient in times of change like we, and crisis like we are experiencing right now. I can tell you that when you run a family business, it stands on one page as well and the decisions are made very quickly and, you know, it's, you, you know what? I actually, well, so. well, you just said Jean-Luc is interesting because I think also Salesforce is a founder-led company. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I would not use the word family business, but uh, uh, you have someone who can make those change very quickly. And indeed, uh, when you have that kind of uh, uh, central uh, element, uh, uh, that obviously facilitates a lot. So. Uh, I support your comment. <laughs> it's all about culture at the end, right? So. But it's culture. I think when the, that's how the founder uh, or the family uh, use the culture. I agree. I mean, uh, we love to say at Salesforce, uh, culture eats strategy for, for breakfast. I think it's a quote from a famous uh, uh, either Garner analyst or uh, it's a famous quote in the industry, which is culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, culture at the end is the enabler. Uh, at the management level of uh, of the agility and the performance of the company. It's All right. Very Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Jean-Luc, you want to add something? Let me no, I just said, you know, I agree. It starts at the top. I mean, it's it's interesting. The other day I was reading an article and they had renamed the CEO the uh, the chief empathy officer. Because obviously <laughs> right. we have to deal with so much now. And obviously we That's have to be job. personable. And we have to listen to our employees, the challenge that, they've, that we've seen during this crisis, uh, people working from home with their kids, homeschooling and all of that, that was a huge challenge. So you have to show a great deal of, uh, of flexibility and, and, and reorganize your management style and all that. And uh, anyway, so it, it comes from the top, but uh, interesting.
All right, thank you to uh, all of you, to all uh, to you three. You were apparently very precise, and uh, you know there were that much, that that many questions, but it was really interesting to have uh, discussed this, this discussion with you. And um, thank you, uh, thank you again. Have um, have a nice day, uh, everyone in San Francisco. Good evening here in Paris, uh, and I leave the the last word to uh, to Laurence. Laurence. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alex, John, Luc, and Anne for this. Uh, very interesting conversation. Um, it was really, uh, you know, I learned a lot of uh, a lot of things too. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, and I hope it was useful for all the participants. Um, we will uh, so share it on on YouTube and and keep you informed about the the next topic of the of the sessions. Uh, we'll have uh, of course a uh, back to work. We'll, we'll do a kind of little break uh, for the the end of of July and, and beginning of August, but we'll be back. Uh, by mid August, so so stay tuned, and um, and hope to see you to see you all back soon. Um, thank you very much again, Gilles, for for the moderation, uh, which was perfect as usual, and uh, <laughs> well, and thank, thank you, you uh, challenge, um, and see you all soon. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Laurence. Thank bye. you, Gilles. Thank and you. bye. Merci. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.